So hopefully there won't be any uh, lines throughout my presentation. Hopefully that's just limited to my previous setup. So I'll be talking a little bit about genomic variation discovery. And to lay it out, uh, I'll talk a little bit of, of introducing the topic. But then I'm going to talk about pretty much the entire pipeline leading up to SNP discovery. And the reason why I do that is it's, it's very much a sequential process. And if you screw up at any point before doing the actual SNP calling, you're going to get very difficult results. And then after SNP discovery, I'll talk a little bit about visualization and then some of the work that I've been doing in the Thousand Genomes Project. Now, why would you study genetic variations? Well, for the first, first of all, you know, when, when you get a big data set, I heard a couple of you mention this morning when you were introducing yourselves, well, we just got a whole bunch of data and then we've aligned it, and now what? Well, this is, this is the killer application for a bunch of data lying around. You know, take a look at what you have. So on one hand, you can use genetic variation discovery to, to look for inherited diseases if you look over many samples. Uh, you can also use it to study uh, phenotypic differences. And also, you can use a coalescent model to try and ascertain ancestral history. Now, at the core of it, when I talk about genetic variation, I usually talk about SNP discovery and also what's called indelling. Those are insertion and deletion events. And so if you're looking at you know, the outputs of two visualization programs, this is constant. You know, here you see uh, a bunch of T alleles where there's supposed to be an A allele in the reference, so that's a typical SNP. And over here we see there's uh, uh, basically an insertion going on, a double A allele has been inserted relative to the genome. But it's not only uh, SNPs and indels that we, we care about. We also uh, are interested in structural variations. And so Mike Brudno is going to be discussing some of that tomorrow. And then we also have other aspects, such as epigenetic variations. You know, not, you know we, we mentioned earlier today, we talked about bisulfite sequencing. And also chip leak is a very uh, that popular thing going on right now. So let's start off with thinking about how we can interpret the data. Now we, we have an Illumina sequencer here, and it's somehow you know interpreting the bases and producing uh, the the actual bases and and uh, perhaps even base qualities. So uh, I guess the first question is, what's a base quality? Why is it interesting? Well, a base quality basically describes what is the probability that any particular base is erroneous. And we, we usually use a log scale to, to depict that. And so if you look at a base quality each one, each 10, you have a 10% uh, likelihood that that base is wrong, 20, you have a 1%, 30, a 0.1%, et cetera, et cetera. So back in the Sanger capillary days, we said, you know, any base that had a base quality of 20 or, or higher was pretty good. These days we're a little bit more demanding and so we like to see things that are like 27 and above. And so uh, just keep this in mind when, when you hear base qualities mentioned that later on in the lecture. Now one of the other things we were discussing here earlier today was the various error rates uh, for each of these technologies. So the first question you might have is, how do you even go about figuring out what the error rate is? Well, usually it involves just aligning a data set against the reference. And then looking at where you have insertions, deletions, and substitutions, uh, and basically uh, considering those as errors. But there are a whole score of caveats involved. First of all, your, your alignment might be paralogous. So you're basically uh, counting against you know, whatever you might think something is an error where when it actually belongs somewhere else. Uh, you might have a local misalignment. So like this C probably actually belongs over there, but depending on the aligner, you may be have a scoring mechanism where this is the optimal alignment. And then you also have polymorphic test data. So if you if you remember <laughs> you have a photographic memory and you remember that uh, table I just showed you. Uh, if you have like a, a, SNP, uh, a SNP rate of one in a thousand bases is a SNP, then you would expect that to be the equivalent of a base quality 30. 
So that means if you if you're trying to ascertain the error rate in a polymorphic data set, then the best you can ever do when you're when you're looking for those error rates is a base quality 30. It'd be impossible to say, okay, this is actually a base quality 40. You don't have that much power. And then the question is, okay, if you're aligning all these reads, what about all those reads that didn't align? So that's a very unhappy kid there. And um, and this this horribly skews how you think of the error rates. If you if you pick very stringent um, alignment criteria, then maybe only the best reads align, and then you'll think, wow, you know, we have 0.1 percent error rate in the sequencing technology, whereas you probably have 4 percent. So these are the caveats involved. But I was going to show you some of the results. So if we're looking at 454. We see that uh, the overall error rate is pretty small. It's less than 0.5 percent. And if if you look at it as a as a chemical reaction, it's it's kind of technically impossible to get a substitution error, but they do happen because of a number of factors. So what you get is you get all these homopolymer situations where instead of saying, you know, there's two A's in a row, you say there's three or one. So you're more likely to see insertion errors uh, than actual deletion errors in 454. Any questions so far? Yeah. I might have this, but why insertion deletion in 454? Oh, it's because of the, the, the whole uh, homopolymer issue. Okay. So when you're aligning it, let's say you really had two A's, but in that one read you had four. Mm -hmm. So that's going to register as, as uh, an, an indel <laughs> error. And that's why you see that, yes. What about placing the error rate? How we can know that there is an error in the read and not in the reference? So that, that's a good point. Ultimately, what you, if, if you have the resources, what you really should do is you should probably take a synthesized oligo or, or a known back or something and then do thorough testing to see what the error rate is. But if you're just playing quick and dirty, this is the, the kind of way that a lot of people do it. Um, in the end, these kind of statistics don't really differ that much. The, the, the actual proportions might shift a couple of percent here and there, um, but when you just evaluate a normal data set, it's pretty, pretty solid. So, error rate is not the same thing as the means of So the way I interpreted your question was you're almost jumping ahead to the actual SNP discovery phase and trying to discover, okay, if you have a false positive, what did that actually, what was it attributed to? Um, there's a whole bunch of a, uh, aspects to that. We'll, we'll get back to that later. And if we don't, please remind me. We look at alumina. We see overall the error rate is slightly higher. Um, we mentioned earlier it's about 1%. But here you see almost the exact opposite. Here, 95% of all your errors are substitutions. So when you guys ask, you know, Mike Brudno, why, why do you usually just ignore <coughs> indel type errors in, in solid and alumina? Well, the cynical answer was because that's what their aligners handle. But one of the, the more factual answers is they don't have too much of that in the, in the actual sequencing chemistry. <laughs> uh, if we look at the error profile of 36 base pair alumina reads, we see the majority of them have zero errors. So about 80% of the reads will have zero errors, and then it goes down uh, subsequently. But these are masks. Yeah. So you've already got negative positive. Yeah. Well, exactly. That's why. That's why there was that really sad kid in that previous poster. And also, it's interesting to know that um, what we've seen, and we haven't gotten a really good answer from Illumina about this, is we've noticed most of the time in paired end reads that the second mate usually has slightly higher, a slightly higher error rate. So you can see that in this graph here. 
but nobody's really been answer, able to answer that. But it's, it's, it's a subtle observation. Another thing, again, talking about Illumina, we see that if we compare different lanes belonging to the same run, we see that the variance in the actual lanes uh, don't differ that much. They differ a little bit. You get most of your variation between runs. Now, I got one of the, these questions during, uh, during one of the breaks today that involves uh, calibrating these base qualities. And so this original here, I, I have that in quotation marks because this is, this is from the Thousand Genomes Project. And what they did early on is they tried to recalibrate all the base qualities for Illumina and, and Solid and, and 454 so that when you look at the reported quality score and then the actual measured quality score, you would like everything to line up on that diagonal if it was perfect. But this is far from the original. This is like pre-calibrated. This is what we used to use. And uh, Mark DePristo at the Broad Institute, he's been working a lot lately on a, a logistic regression model where he basically use, uses uh, sequence content to make this a lot nicer. It's kind of curious, this little, this little aberration there. But on the whole, you get this beautiful, uh, well, you don't get any bias anymore. Now, what's interesting about this is this is nothing that you need to do beforehand. This, this uh, logistic regression model is after you've aligned your, your data set. You can just run this regression model, and it'll fix all the base qualities before you run your SNP discovery. So I'm pretty excited about this. I haven't used this myself, but I thought I would just mention it. Now, my core research topic is uh, read alignment. And so this is why uh, this will probably occupy most of the talk, because this is what's near and dear to my heart. And also because it, it probably has the most uh, impact on your SNP calling. So you guys use a really old version of PowerPoint. Okay? Do you remember this? Is also this was supposed to be a little All right. So we already talked a little bit earlier today about de novo assembly. And so what I'll be talking about here is reference guided assembly. What's that? It was like three years ago, like in 2006, they came out with like Office 2007. <laughs> just, just a reminder. You know. Anyway, um, so all these nasty colors here basically represent uh, several reads that you have, and you want to align it to your reference. Now, what most aligners do is they'll do pairwise alignment. So already from this point. Each of these reads here, you can see how they're associated with the reference. And you can sort of figure out where the SNPs and insertions and relations might be by looking at this. But what we typically do with Mosaic is we go one step further and create a multiple sequence alignment. And that way you can use the statistical power of high coverage to, to elucidate you know, more convincingly, is this actually a deletion or a, or a SNP? I'm going to have to go like that. And then we can use our, our uh, visualization tools to, to look at these. The other thing that sets Mosaic uh, apart from many other aligners is we try and uh, support all the uh, existing sequencing technologies. So it, in addition to supporting the old style Sanger capillary, we also support Illumina, 454, Solid, Ubicos, and when they finally release a data set to us, we'll also support PacBio. Now, this is kind of uh, uh, showing the basic structure of Mosaic. You, you have a program up here called Mosaic Build. And Mosaic Build simply takes your reads from various formats. If it's fast A, fast Q, there's also the short read format that Awesome has been uh, instrumental in putting together. So. It, if you're curious about that, you can pound him about that tomorrow. Also, the, the native Illumina formats, the Buster and Gerald format, they support. Um, and basically, that's just to make it so that Mosaic can use these formats no matter what. <coughs> and then the actual aligner will basically hash these up, like Mike Bruno was talking about earlier, about hashing things up into different k -mers. That's what we do, and then we cluster those together. 
we finally use uh, a very uh, accurate Smith-Waterman algorithm. So that will produce a little read archive, and then the mosaic assembler actually produces a multiple sequence alignment out of it and creates an assembly file. So usually we used to uh, create ACE files, and today we'll be creating uh, files in this gigabase format, which is our SNP caller. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So he asked, he asked what everyone usually asks when they see this slide, and they're like, good God, man, is this guy crazy? Why is he doing Smith-Waterman? Isn't that insanely slow? And yes, it's a very computationally expensive algorithm. However, with the exception of Elan, we are the fastest aligner out there. So it's kind of this, this difference between being uh, theoretically um, a very hard problem. I wouldn't say it's an NP hard problem, because it isn't, but, and being like uh, able to do this in practice. So uh, yeah, we're, we're able to do this really fast. Like for a small uh, yeast genomes uh, with an eight core computer, we usually align like 100,000 reads per second. So like, you can do these pretty fast. We'll be going slightly slower today during the lab, but, but uh, no, no, there's, it's, it's, a, it's, a good, uh, it's a good question, but you can overcome some of these limitations. Our big problem is we use a lot of RAM right now, so we're trying to, to bring that down. So when you have crazy advisors, sometimes they come to you with a pile of data and say, please, please analyze this. And so that happened to me last fall. My advisor came to me with 6 billion 454 in Illumina reads and said, can you please align these and look for SNPs and index? So I put together the pipeline, and using Mosaic and Gigabase, it actually, on a nine-node cluster, took nine days to complete. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of the time you see here is the actual alignment time. We also sort the reads according to position. That makes life easier for, for the uh, multiple sequence alignment generator, and also makes things a lot nicer when we're doing the SNP problem. <coughs> And so each each of those nodes had eight processors. So ultimately, how does it work? Well, as, as we mentioned, we, we have these little tamers. And so in this example, I'm, I'm showing a tamer at four, which is ridiculously small. We, we use something much larger than that. And so obviously, if you were going to try and align this read to the reference, you would assume all these tamers to be the ones you wanted to try. However, uh, just like Mike Brudno said, you know, when you're using small tamers, a lot of things start looking repetitive. So you also, this little TTCT here also matches this TTCT. And just in this little toy example, this is what it looks like in the end. And so if you take this on, on a genomic scale, you know, 3 billion bases, even if you use a much larger hash size, this is the kind of phenomenon you see. So we, we have a position uh, aware uh, clustering algorithm that tries to figure out which of these is the most likely. Uh, also, when it comes to aligning the reads, uh, there's some different arguments. I wouldn't put it as uh, as uh, high as the uh, string uh, string method and the De Bruyne method kind of religious battles. It's more subtle than that. What do you do with the reads when you find they can go to multiple places? Well, one scenario is you can align only the unique reads, and if you have something that's non-unique, you just kind of throw it kind of away from it. Another scenario is you align it everywhere you can. And then there's a third scenario where you just kind of pick a random position. So I'm not a very keen subscriber to the last scenario, so Mosaic supports the first two. Uh, this is a typical one used, uh, for example, on the Mac aligner. It'll pick a, a random location. We also have a lot of platform-specific things. Uh, I'll just mention two of them. Uh, one is when you're aligning 454 reads, you're going to have a lot of these uh, gaps opening up. However, you don't want to penalize a gap that occurs in a homopolymer as much as you would penalize something that's a you know, appears elsewhere. 
So in this case, we don't penalize this gap as much as, as gap number one or four, five, four. Yeah? How do I decide which? What size is OK, so in our lab, we've just standardized on using a K-mer size of 15. That's, that's what we use for, for most things, unless, unless we, we do. So most of our work is on mammalian size genomes. And so 15 is basically a, a compromise, improving the speed there. Uh, when it comes to you know, uh, bacterial or, or yeast size genomes, so we'll, probably go down to like nine. It's, it's really a sensitivity versus performance type, uh, type exercise. And then for AB, um, as I mentioned, a lot of aligners, when they first uh, tried supporting AB, all they did is they converted all the zeros, one, twos, and threes in color space to ACG and Ts. And then they just say, cool, we're aligning in color space. What they forgot about is what we've already mentioned today, that you no longer take the reverse complement to figure out what's on the reverse strand. You simply reverse the actual, uh, the, the actual sequence when you're trying to align it. So uh, in the early days of, of color space, you had a lot of aligners that would get every single alignment in the reverse strand wrong. So uh, it's important to keep these things in mind, even though they seem very trivial. Now, one of the other benefits with Mosaic, and also with um, the program they developed in, in Mike Brudno's lab is since we use a Smith-Waterman type algorithm, it's very handy for short indel detection. So in this C. elegans paper that, that we uh, collaborated with, we, we identified 216 uh, proper indels, and we had a very high validation rate, 89%. That's almost unheard of if you come back from the Sanger capillary days and you try to validate indels, uh, the normal figure there would have been around 30% of your indels would have validated. So that was, that was pretty impressive. Another question that was asked today is, how about combining different technologies? And so that's what we do particularly well. This was a project where we tried to align, uh, like a, I was going to say, a biofuel-friendly uh, yeast called PTS tepidus. Uh, we were trying to, uh, to evaluate different sequencing technologies and how well we could figure out where this one point mutation was. But we had reads from Sanger Capillary. Those were actually our SNP validation reads. Uh, 454 FLX reads, the older 454 GS20 reads, and then also Illumina reads, all together in the same thing. And just like Mike Brudno said, you can use the, the, difference, uh, the different aspects of these technologies uh, to produce a more coherent uh, data set when you're looking for SNPs. Michael? Yes? So, so you have a rendering problem and when you scale up a number of reads, is it, uh, there's no lag in rendering? No, no, no. Actually, so, so when it comes to speed, the only limiting factor with, with speed is uh, the length of your genome. So yeah, yeah, if, if you were to try and align the lily genome, I think Mosaic would just die. Um, but uh, no, we can handle mammalian type genomes pretty easily. And so that's why when we had six billion reads to align, it wasn't that long. Well, I skipped over this, this past slide because I think we've killed this topic of what is a period of read. And so I think it was explained a lot better than I would have done right there. So. So how do we resolve paired end reads? Well, Mosaic, what it does is it aligns both of those ends separately, and then it tries to analyze, OK, how can we arrange these? So in the first aspect, you can basically take all your um, uniquely mapped reads. So if, if both of the, the pairs aligned uniquely, you can use those to build up an empirical distribution of your fragment link. A lot of aligners out there, you have to say, oh, I use 200 base pair, uh, like fragment library. And that might have been what you intended, but you know how you actually excise the gel and how it actually turned out might be slightly different. So that's why we empirically deduce that from the, the data set you have. And then you just check to see, OK, in the end, 
do these two unique uh, pairs actually conform to this confidence interval that you've created? So you can use the same kind of technique to look at if you have one end is unique but the other end is non-unique. Then if you find one pair that fits this criteria, then, then you can probably use that. But if you find several, then you're still uncertain. And in the, in the same methodology, you can also look at if you have non-unique on both ends. But that's a little bit dodgier. That um, you usually have a higher error rate associated with that. But that's that's something I've not done before. We we have a bunch of like peripheral programs. We'll talk more about this during the lab. Mosaic coverage just easily produces coverage diagrams, um, which is great for like gypsy experiments. Then you can also use that to find out what's happening over here. And you see the coverage dips in these two regions. Did you notice how big these gaps need to be? Each of these tags are about 100. So 300 base pairs, what, what do you think that might be? Yeah. Yeah, it very much looks like an olive. And so one of the things, so I printed out just the unique portions. So what, what you see here is uh, all the contributions from unique reads. And so what, what you see then is dips wherever you have something that's hyper, hyper repetitive. So this is a very interesting way of, of identifying olives. Is there any way to normalize it? Are there Well, I think that that might be what like the people behind Mac tried to do. They they aligned randomly, and that way, if you can't figure out exactly where it goes. Maybe if you play something randomly, it will normalize the coverage. This is this to me is actually far more desirable than the opposite effect. It, some aligners there aren't very tolerant to repetitive elements, and what you'll see is you'll see huge peaks when when you have something repetitive, and that's just going to throw everything out the door when you're trying to do SNP discovery or indel discovery. Both behaviors are absolutely desirable. I'd like to have. That's true, but you can, you can, you can use that mode where you say align everywhere possible. Yeah, yeah. So one thing you can do is you can divide the number of divide the contribution by the number of places in this case. So we we actually have that. We're going to talk a little bit about alignment qualities in like two slides. Um, we also have a little. Uh, program that converts, you know, we realize not everybody wants to work in the Mosaic world and they want to use some other programs in their pipeline. So we have this Mosaic text program that right now converts things into the bed format, the e -bed format. There's a format supported in BLAT that we really like called AXT. And then new, within the thousand genomes, we're hoping it spreads further out, is called the SAM format, which is, we're trying to have this as like a, a universal alignment format. And it's a binary equivalent called BAM. Yes? This photo of the figure lies the symmetry in the So this is this is way before we even bother looking for SNPs. So no, we, we don't have that right now. But we do have that in our visualization tools. Yeah? So what's the extent of uh band band? <laughs> you said you could edit things out. Hey. <laughs> 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 no, no, no it, it seems like a decent attempt. Um, Wait, so besides the thousand genome process, no, well, it was it was that format was created within the thousand genomes format just because it was we were all going crazy. Everybody was using different aligners. And then the people that were doing structural variation research and, and also SNP and indel calling, you'd have to write a new parser for every single uh, aligner out there. So this this was just a way to, to manage stress levels. Yeah. So, uh, the still probably the, uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, it seems uh, 
it, it works. I don't think it's the most efficient. Uh, if you ask my advisor, he loves it to death. So, yeah. So yeah, it, different takes on different things. But yeah, we, we support it. <laughs> um, the love of ambiguity. Here, here's something I think we're, we're kind of unique. And that is, um, you know, when you're lining reads from, that are taken from one individual against the current reference genome, you're going to get a bias against whatever SNPs you had in that data set relative to that genome. What I mean is if you, if you have something that's homozygous in one individual in your data set, but you're trying to align it to that genome, it'll show up as a mismatch for that base. And that'll contribute, you know, usually when you align these reads, whatever aligner you use, you usually place some sort of a threshold. Do you allow, do you allow two mismatches or four mismatches or some percentage of mismatches? So what we did is we supported these IUPAC ambiguity codes. And what you can do with that is you can get a reference sequence that has been masked for all the DB SNP and half map 3 locations. And by doing that, you can align a read, and if, if that read has one of the two alleles or one of the three alleles denoted by that ambiguity code, you won't incur a mismatch score. And so this is, this is something we've supported for a while, but we haven't tested it that well. Um, something I'm hoping to take a look at in like another moment. Now here's a horribly skewed feature chart. Uh, however, it does show that there's a wide variation in the different styles of the aligners. And, and as me and Mike pointed out uh, before that, uh, before we went to lunch, there's probably 30 aligners out there now. So this this one's kind of dated. This one's from like a, a year ago. But um, where, where Mosaic stands out is we support a lot of sequencing platforms. Uh, together with Shrimp, we we do uh, we use the SNP Waterman algorithm, which helps us do gap alignment. Uh, right now, all of them support paired end reads, at least the ones that we have here. And then, uh, being a computer scientist, I don't mind if people download things and, and compile their code, but a lot of biologists don't know how to compile code. So we have a lot of platform binaries out there. And, and one of the jokes we did uh, like a year ago is we made a binary for the iPhone. And so, yeah, for, for a small data set, <laughs> For a back-sized data set, you could align how many Illumina reads you wanted. It, it was a gimmick just to show one of the one of the signs of how robust your code is. Is is it sort of platform independent? Can you get it to easily work on a different platform? Uh, these days in bioinformatics, it's all too easy that somebody will use GCC on Linux and then expect it to work everywhere, and they'll figure out they used something specific. No, I haven't. Um, I, I just have like some personal experience there, but I don't have any like like comparisons. The, the guy that wrote Nobel Line was uh, originally at um, what's that Malaysian outfit? I, I'll get back to it during the, the the break. Another question is how well can your liner um, classify reads as unique or non-unique? This turns out to be a pretty big issue later on. And um, Mosaic did pretty well when compared to ELAN. And so Mac, you can't actually figure it out because it actually randomly assigns and doesn't give you like an inkling. You can kind of use their mapping quality as, as a, a proxy for that, but it's, that's a mess. As far as actual accuracy goes, uh, so if you have a, a simulated data set, how accurately can you line the reads? And as you would expect, for so th all the reads are, are marked in uh, blue, uh, all the SNPs are marked in green, and for the most part in those two data sets, they all do fairly similar. Here's where the uh, the gap alignment approach really helps. With all the reads that have indels in them, you see Mosaic clearly outperforms Eli Mac, and so actually SOAP does surprisingly well here. I don't know if it was a fluke of the data set or whatever, but they it should have been down there as well. But they got up to the 40% line, which impressed me. And this is what I was talking about alignment qualities. We've had alignment qualities in Mosaic for roughly a year. 
but uh, they need some serious tweaking. So the last couple of weeks, I've been looking at this. So what does this mountain represent? We found out that at least when mosaic is concerned, there are two, uh, two different criteria that seem to contribute to how good or how well is, is the alignment played. One is information content, so that's basically an application of Shannon's entropy. The other one is if you take the sum of all the mismatch base qualities and divide that by the total sum of the base qualities, you see that you have a very well-formed uh, uh, distribution here. You have a curious little aberration there. But we're basically using this model now to investigate how it looks when you have different read links and different reference links to see if that also uh, poses uh, some kind of well, you can think about it this way. If you have a reference sequence that's 35 base pairs long, and you have a read that's 35 base pairs, that's exactly the same, I would hope you would place it correctly. However, if you have something that's 3 billion bases long, those odds are no longer as high. So this is my supervisor here. He's very happy. Um, and this is uh, Reverend Bayes, uh, responsible for the Bayesian type algorithms and so as a big fan of Thomas Bayes, he, he names all his programs after Bayes. And so the, the newest art incarnation is called Gigabase. Now to reiterate where most Gigabase concentrates on finding both knit and insertion and deletion lines. And so the goal is so I've I've marked all the mismatches here in red. The goal is you want to be able to to sort out normal sequencing errors from an actual step. And one of the, the major ways of doing this is by looking very closely at the base quality. And you want to do it in a certain way so that you know if you have a high base quality mismatch, you're more likely to call this a SNP than if you had a low quality mismatch or from here. Here both the reference and the the read had a very low quality. So this is kind of up in the air if this is really a SNP or not, whereas you're much more confident here. Because this indicates, you know, you have a 0.1% here and this is 0.01% here. This is the actual equation, and at the end of the lab, I expect all of you to memorize this. <laughs> <laughs> but in actuality, it's, it's not that complex. Really, you're, you're taking into account the number of individuals that you're trying to to, uh, to genotype and call SNPs in. Uh, we have a lot of um, dependencies on the actual base quality and the actual allele calls in the read. So th th there's other, I mean, as, as soon as you start looking at you know, SNP calling, you see all, there's a lot of caveats involved. Um, for example, you know, calling SNPs in a haploid data set versus a diploid data set. This is very, uh, this is very relevant in the thousand genomes because you know you tend to use one one program to call the SNPs in the thousand genomes, but not many people think to consider perhaps uh, if it's a male, you know, aligning uh, doing SNP calling in, in in the X and Y chromosomes as a haploid data set. And also a, a big onus on, on the SNP callers to produce genotype calls, so that's obviously different for both the half and diploid variants. Um, one of my main projects in the thousand genomes um, arena is handling trios of individuals. This is actually kind of, you know, when it comes to computational biology, there's often like new challenges here and there that that mean your your life gets harder and harder to, to cope with, with, with different assignments. But trios actually make things a lot nicer because suddenly you have a duplication of, of data within the three individuals you're looking at. So this gives you a lot more power to distinguish between sequencing type errors and alignment type errors from, from the actual polymorphism. And one of the other aspects that makes that, that counteract that is you always have some probability that you have a de novo mutation rate in the child. So you need to take that into account as well. The easy part of the Thousand Genomes project has been aligning things and doing the SNP codes. 
now what they're facing is how do we know these are right? Because uh, for, for any, any particular individual, they're calling around 4 million SNPs. And it's unlikely that you're going to use any assay to try and validate even a, a good portion of those. So one of the big things that they looked at is the actual coverage. And so what they've actually done here is to cover it. The red denotes the coverage of half match sites in our data set, whereas the blue kind of shows you know, all the sites. And so what you see here is maybe if you place some sort of a threshold around the coverage of the half map site, you might be able to, to you know, minimize your false positives quite drastically. There's some caveats involved with that. That is, the half map data set is fairly high frequency SNPs. One of the goals of that in genomes is to go down to the 1%, 0.1% of real frequency. Um, this may no longer be relevant in that case. And there's also, you know, if you have too many SNPs in one area, that's also indicative of some sort of an alignment to uh, So one of the things I plotted here is, you know, what which SNPs were in DB SNP and which were in, in the Sanger data set that um, the team we, we collaborate with, and which ones were not in those two. And basically, you see from about 15, so, so if the SNP between two SNP, if the distance between two SNPs is like less than 15, it was more likely to be something that was not in one of those two data sets, and perhaps likely to be an error. So this, this is one method of how you can make a threshold saying, OK, we'll ignore everything that's like over or, or under 14 data points. Then also from population genetics, you can also look at the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And if we look at the, the uh, probability of segregating sites at the half map location, you see a fairly even distribution here uh, with the test statistic. But then if we compare this to the, all the sites, you see like these regions here look fairly erroneous. So maybe you could create a filter there to, uh, to screen those out. There are other metrics involved. A lot of the uh, a lot of the SNP callers will produce a, a probability. What's the probability that this site is polymorphic? And so you can place a threshold there. And then also, uh, our friends at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute, they, they actively try and optimize their SNP calls so that their transition to transversion ratio is as close to two as possible. And how would that help? Well, theoretically, that's supposed to be the optimum. And then when you look at, if you look at half map sites, um, you're, you're almost exactly at transition to transversion ratio of two. Where, where things become a little bit fuzzy is, are there hot spots? For example, if you limit your, uh, if you do exon capture, and you only look at like genic region, do you still expect the same sort of transition transver transversion ratio? Or is it going to be different? That's something that hasn't been clarified yet. So yeah, this happy guy, that's Derek. He's in our lab. And uh, if you haven't caught on by now, I guess one of the popular pastimes in our lab is coming up with some weird name and a logo attached to it. And so uh, he called his visualization tool Gambit. And before Gambit, we pretty much used uh, an old trusty favorite concept, which was popular in the Sanger Kaplan era. Uh, but it has its uh, downsides. If you have a very large data set, it requires an enormous amount of memory. It takes forever to load. Uh, I think with my D-Trio, just to look at chromosome 1, I have to wait an hour and a half for it to load everything up. Uh, and that was on a fast computer. So now we have Gambit, which you also notice that you pretty much have a read for every line in concept. Most of the modern visualizers, they try and compact everything so it more closely approximates sort of a coverage diagram. And so we're using Gambit to do some data validation, generate new biological hypotheses. Um, mostly for us, it's a software development aid just to see, OK, how are my current alignments looking? Do I have any artifacts? It uses the BAM support. But what's going to be interesting about Gambit is it's um, it's going to use like Firefox type plugins. So what on earth do I mean by that? Um, one of the things we've noticed when we work with uh, other labs, even 
uh, at our department is, you know, next gen sequencing is still far removed away from what the normal molecular biology lab can cope with. But if you do some mutational profiling, can you expect a normal mutation, uh, a normal molecular biology lab to actually analyze that? And the answer is increasingly no. So we're trying to make applications that will sort that out. So the idea is to make plugins that will help do analysis on these. So for example, one of my colleagues in the lab, she does a lot of transcriptomics. So one of the plugins actually does, you know, you can look at your technical replicates and your biological replicates and produce graphs attached to that. And so in that way, we hope to extend this more and more and more. So the last part I'll talk about is the Thousand Genomes Project. You guys have probably heard two bits here and there about what it's involved, or what, what the goals are. The major goals are you want to get down to discovering genetic variations at the 1% level across the entire genome. But then in, in uh, gene regions, they want to get down to the 0.1%. And so with, with these uh, variants that they discover, they want to estimate the, you know, the allele frequency. Um, they want to identify the haplotype background and also characterize LD. Now this kind of gives, uh, this slide has been updated a little bit from what you have in your printout. This shows we have three major pilot projects within that Athendino uh, project. What is the pilot one? Pilot one is low coverage. We have many samples that are between 2 and 4x. Um, so we have 2.7 terabases of, of data for that project, most of it being Illumina, uh, then solid, and then some 4.4. The project I've been most uh, involved with is the Pilot 2 data, which are deep sequence trios. Uh, we have a European trio and a European trio. And so we have 1.1 terabases of data there. And then Pilot 3 is a relative newcomer to the project. It involves exon capture. They have an outstanding number of samples, 607 samples right now. Um, however, the the target area has been reduced, so they have a total of about 2.2 megabases of target regions um, distributed over about 8,800 targets. And so the average coverage for each of those is about 10 to 20x. So in my pilot two study, one of the things we do, and one of the things you guys will do after the break, is compare the SNP calls you make to the half map and the SNP. And they both uh, basically answer two different questions. When you compare SNP calls to DB SNP, DB SNP kind of contains everything under the sun. It has some good SNPs and it has some bad SNPs. But the idea there is if you have a lot of SNP calls that don't are not already in DB SNP, then that might be a sign that you have a lot of false positives. So it's basically a proxy for a thing, how many false positives you might have. Have map 3, on the other hand, you have a lot fewer samples, and, and they're actually genotyped for the actual samples we're looking at. And so if you're missing, uh, if you're missing anything from that, those samples, it's kind of a proxy for false negatives. So here you saw I missed 4.4% of the half map 3 SNPs in chromosome 1. Um, so that shows that we probably have like a, a 4 or 5% false negative rate. And then we have 20% of the calls are not in DB SNP. Now, some proportion of that are going to be true SNPs that are just not in DB SNP. Yet. But some of them are going to be false positives. And so that's what we'll be looking at uh, this afternoon. Now, if we actually look at the concordance between DB SNP, our calls, and the Sanger Institute, we see there's a, the majority are actually shared between all three data sets. But then you see some, some elements like 6,000 of the SNPs were not in the Sanger set, but were in ours and DB SNP, and then 15K was in their set, but not in ours. You can have a lot of fun with fun Venn diagrams. <laughs> Another thing that I, I, I did a lot with is um, making indel calls. And what we see here is uh, kind of a weird way of showing it, but 
when they validated these insertion and deletion events, they categorized them into four different categories. Um, homopolymer rungs um, that are longer than four bases, uh, another one that's longer than two bases, and here's just simple one base pair insertions and deletions. And so I basically just summed all this up. So with this CL here, if you had a perfect indel collar that performed at 100%, this scale would go up to 4.0, basically 1.0 for each 100%. But you see the cold reality here is we're probably at like 1.7. So we're not even like able to validate 50% of the indels in this huge project accurately. So there's a, there's a major activity at the moment to try and you know, spruce up the indel collars and make them more accurate. So uh, that's one of the big competitions right now in thousand years. So what have you learned today? Well, first of all, garbage in, garbage out. If you have a mistake already at the base calling, that's going to affect, you know, your alignments and then it's going to affect your snip calling. So it's essential that you try and keep everything as pristine as possible, use the highest accuracy possible. So that might be the only example where who cares about 5%. You know, when, when everything counts, that 5% might make the difference between good and bad calls. Because it's expensive to validate. So you want to get the, the, truest, the, the truest calls possible. Another one is use the right tools. And by that, I don't mean use our tools. I mean, you know, for whatever problem you have, try and figure out what's the proper tool. Don't, don't do this, this in a sort of lazy approach where you hear everyone's using this one tool, so you might as well do it too. It pays off to spend maybe a couple of days researching the tools and figure out, okay, which one will actually deliver what you're trying to accomplish. Now finally, population genetics is, is seeming more and more like the, the ultimate quality control for a SNP call. It's been largely ignored uh, for I don't know how long, but now suddenly in the last few months in the Thousand Genomes Project, suddenly the population geneticists are getting like their due credit and, and they're like uh, shining in the limelight. So uh, kudos to them. This is just uh, the usual suspects from our famous leader. That's it for now. Any questions before we go on break?